Hey, this is Steve Good on the Coin Chat with Yuri Cataldo, and we are joined by special guest Mary Camacho, Executive Director from Holochain. So, Mary, welcome to our episode of Women in Blockchain. It's great to have you. Thanks. It's great to be here. It's a pleasure. <laughs> so, before well, we jump in, uh, <laughs> we'd love to know how is it that you got interested in technology and got started in, in, in it yourself? Ah, well, that's interesting. I, I've actually been in tech for all of my career since the early 90s when I started working in telecom. I wasn't hired in, in as a technologist or computers or anything like that. I was in operations. Um, but this job that I walked into when I was 22 years old basically showed me an office and said, here you go. And I looked around and everything was manual. Like they wanted me to write down the name of everything. Wow. Like phone bills that had to be submitted for cell towers month after month to be paid. And they wanted me to write them in by hand on forms. And I'm like, wow. why? And so I just started automating things. Um, and at the time, this was before, you know, even access was made, was created. So I was working in, I think it was FileMaker Pro. And oh my gosh, that's just like thinking yeah, <laughs> exactly. If we're talking back ways, but I but like, I was let's like, not give our ages away by talking about software we know from. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start. You know, we're starting early. You asked yeah. me how I got into it. No, but it was really interesting because it wasn't even a relational database at the time, and so trying to connect the dots, trying to push things, and, and then I started figuring out how to code. Then access came out. Then I went to get to classes on how do I make all this stuff go together and work. Then suddenly I was designing systems. Then I was rolling them out to other people. Then I was working in accounting software. It just went from one thing to another. Um, but basically it's been my entire career. I mean, eventually I was working with web technologies and developing um, websites in the early days, then web applications after that when they started you know, growing. Um, now I'm working in crypto and web and hosting and telecom all mixed together and rolled into one. That's so cool. <laughs> That's amazing. All together. Yeah. So how, how do you find it when it comes to, you know, trying to hire people, uh, huh? women, to hire women in the yes. chain? I mean, I know you guys have had adverts out. I mean, and, and I'm sure, sure right. you're looking for well, people all the time. So tell, tell us about that. Yeah, well, we've been growing our team for the last six to eight months. I mean, we did our ICO back in April of last year. And so it's been uh, quite the process to, to build the team. And we're completely remote, so we're all over the world and, and pretty flexible about that. And it's been really tough to find women for technical roles. And we've had our attention on this. We've even participated in women in blockchain events. Um, but the reality is, is we don't get a lot of women applying for the technical roles. We actually have two women in our technical team. One is in UI UX, and then the other is a front end developer. So it's not that we don't have any women on our team. We do, but we have been targeting, you know, that as an intent, intent for many of the roles. And we just don't get a lot of qualified applicants that come in. And quite honestly, we just don't get hardly any women applicants in for the technical. Is there anything you can do to target more women for, for applying for jobs in general? Or is it well, kind of, I mean, I don't know, do, do men go to different job sites than women might go to? <laughs> I don't know. I never thought about it, but. You know, I can, t I mean, I can say that, you know, for certain roles, we get more women or more men from certain postings than others. For example, if I go and post on the crypto jobs, um, site almost all men apply uh, that's who's paying attention to that particular Twitter feed that particular website all those different things mm -hmm. um, but you know we did go and like I said to events specifically about women in blockchain um, but the issue is is that not a lot of women out of those kinds of programs right now are actually um, experienced developers yet they're they're in early stages just right. kind of getting into a development career so right. that doesn't really work as a channel for hiring just yet mm -hmm. um, I'm involved in a lot of women in technology groups I certainly send information out but I think it may be because we're in the crypto space it may be because we're using cutting-edge technologies I mean we're, we're using rust in our core and we prefer having developers come in with rust that's a hard skill to find pretty much across the board, much less to target it and say, oh, we'd like women Rust developers um, at this stage. So 
Right. That's what we're finding. Yeah. Wow. But I wonder if there's also the like a certainty type of factor in there. There, I uh, I listened to a, a it was a, a MIT researcher who worked with LinkedIn to try to find ways to get more women to apply for jobs, and they found out that by posting the number of applicants somewhere on the application that they had more women apply, regardless of like what the the number was. So uh, uh, they had some, some kind of thesis really? where, yeah, like where the more certainty associated with the job that the more, the higher probability of women applying. Interesting. Really? So, so is it, are they look, do, so were they going for a level of like uh, comfort or assuredness that it's real or, I mean, what, what is it that the number represented? They were, they were kind of vague on that part of it, but there was, I, their thesis was partially of, I think men have a tendency of just like applying for jobs that sometimes they don't feel qualified for. They'll just like blankly apply for things. And <laughs> they've noticed that like when discussing it with, with certain women, women's groups that they want to make sure they check all of the boxes. And apparently when they uh -huh. check all the boxes and they can see like the percentage or the number of people who are applying for this job, that those odds went up. Wow. That's interesting. You know, I, I, I'm a little bit of an oddball in my career, in my field. And um, what you just said reminded me of something for early in my career, which was I made a decision in my 20s to never apply for a job that I was fully qualified for. Hmm. Mm -hmm. um, because I got a job one time when I was fully qualified and I was bored out of my mind. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, why would you want to apply for something that you're already fully qualified for? Then there's no growth opportunity. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. And so that, that's just been sort of a career, you know, choice. So if people had other time, development skills, for, women think that way. Yeah. yeah. So if people had other, women had other development skills, let's say if they had C sharp or if they had um, solidity or other development skills, would that not mean that they couldn't learn rust? And work oh, with certainly. Them? Certainly. Um, it's not that uh, even all of the, the roles require that per se, that's just been an area where we've been especially trying to find developers. So um, we, we don't have all the rules say that you must know something like Rust. We've had, you know, basically full stack where almost it doesn't really matter what you've worked in in the past. Holochain is so different that if you have any sort of either full stack web, client server background, those sorts of things help. Obviously, we like the developers that have a growth orientation. So yeah. if they're wanting to learn new things, if they're self-motivated, if they're used to working in remote sort of situations um, and like it and actually thrive in those you know, environments, those are some of the things we're really looking for with people. Yeah. Um, but we don't typically say you have to have this one skill. I mean, occasionally we have a DevOps role that is very explicit. We, we really need somebody with certain experience um, or for the whole chain core team, which is where we really have to have somebody who at least knows the basics of Rust or typed, you know, languages at, at the very least. Uh, that's important. But no, we're not, we're not that harsh about it. So we just don't get a lot of applicants. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, I just didn't know whether or not that kind of a skill might scare people off who, as we said, if you don't have the skill, you don't apply, as opposed to, hey, if you've got good techie development skills, please apply here and you're going to learn new skills like Rust, which will make you even more valuable to the world. Yeah. And, and don't get me wrong, we do get a lot of applicants for a lot of the jobs. It's not, it's not as if we're, we're lacking for numbers. Um, on it. And, and that's really, we're, you know, I'm super grateful about that because it means we can actually get the right fit for our needs and the, the right person that's going to fit inside the team from a culture perspective and sort of be able to work with the other developers in certain groups. Sure. And that's, that's critical. Uh, but, but, it, but it, to, to your point, I mean, it, it, it is tough. It's not as easy to, to have qualified applicants come in who are women. And yeah. we'd like more of them. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting for me is that, you know, having worked for an Indian company for a number mm -hmm. of years, what I, what I found there was the remarkable number of women that were in development and testing roles. It was just like having worked in, in London uh, for a number mm -hmm. of years and worked with U.S. And, uh, and British and European companies for all these oh. years. And, you know, the number of developers we had that were women was practically nil. And then all, I'm, I'm, I'm in the midst yeah. of Indian culture and it was about 40% women, literally. 
between developers and testers and analysts. And I'm like, this is great. It was, they felt so normal and balanced. It didn't feel like it was so heavily male skewed where men were just being men and being a little bit like too comfortable being men in a room because there were no women there. It felt right. more like a normal working uh, environment. Um, and what's interesting in India is all these technical universities that are encouraging technical expertise and experience. Um, mm -hmm. Even to the point that after I left Infosys and, uh, and Yuri and I embarked on another project for a period of time, our lead developer was a, was a woman mm -hmm. from India. Yeah, you and know. She was a great well, developer. And so we let her run the thing because she was great at it. But it was a really nice eye opening experience for me to see that level of, you know, uh, engagement from women because the the country encourages that level of education. Unfortunately, on the flip side, India has not been very uh, <laughs> supportive of blockchain development. So that's probably right. not helped for the women right. getting involved in that space. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it is interesting about the domain space and I, you know, to what you were saying, Yuri, about um, what it is that has people you know, apply for certain jobs versus others. When I was working in telecom, I had this experience. I was in IT in, in, in telecom, and it was great. I walked into this room where we were starting a new project, and there were four women in the room, period, running the project. We had data um, warehouse expertise. We had, you know, application uh, architects. We had me sort of uh, leading the, the project. And there was somebody else, I think it was one of the develop just another developer who was there for the beginning where we were setting the course for this project. And we looked around at each other and went, have you ever had this happen before? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was just so odd. <laughs> Never will forget that experience. Wow. Mary, could you talk a little bit about your journey to C-suite? Because I think some of the, in some of the articles we've been researching and looking at, there is, yeah. it's like less than 7% of women developers make it to C-suite and there's a huge ceiling right. there. So in your right. own journey, what are some things that you did that kind of pushed you Start along the way? Startup. It's all startup. I mean, I don't think, I think it's so difficult to go the corporate route and end up in as an executive, uh, it just, it's really tough. You get stuck in the VP levels for the mm -hmm. most part. And for me, I have always, I spoke earlier about, you know, not wanting a job that I had, that I was already skilled for. I have yeah. always had a growth orientation to my work. Mm -hmm. um, and so startup has just been a natural place uh, for me to fit in. I've been creating companies and creating products. I mean, practically since my, my mid twenties, late twenties. And, um, I think that sort of thing gives you the experience of seeing the whole, of having to be responsible for the whole. And yeah, maybe you do it in somewhat neophyte ways early on because you don't know what you don't know when you're getting started. Sure. Um, yeah. But you just keep doing that and you build it. You know, and I've gone back and forth between the corporate world and the startup world and, and over the, the last 20 years, but my love really is bringing innovation and startup technologies um, into the world. And so when this one came around in particular, some of um, Arthur Brock, who's one of the founders, is actually a former partner in a previous company. So he is one of the people who reached out and asked me to kind of come and work with him. And we weren't even sure what role I was going to take on um, here at the company because, I mean, I could have just as easily ended up in, in product de de development and uh, been, been working more closely with our technical teams. But what was needed at the time was sort of bringing it all together and holding that whole strategically. Um, and that's what I had a capacity for doing, having worked in operations, worked in finance, worked in product. And that view is just something that you can't get easily mm -hmm. uh, when you work in, corp in the corporate world. You tend to be more sort of geared in one direction or another. And so it's if, if women aren't going and saying, oh, I want to shift into something completely different and learn this other area of the company and take that risk, then it's hard to keep moving up the, the, the ladder and, and get more broad roles in you know, corporate America. Yes. Yeah. I'm not as familiar with these roles, you know, with the with the the dynamics that happen in some of the other places in the world. Sure. Um, I'm working globally. You know, my background certainly is U.S. companies. So we were talking before we started the show as well about kind of the history of how um, the jobs for women have evolved over time. And you made some interesting reference to the fact <laughs> that 
back and maybe it was, a, well, maybe you should tell the story about how you, yeah, sure. yeah. Well, you know, we were talking about how many women are in technology in the U.S. And I think you were, you, you said, what was the percentage? 20? 20, I think it was like, yeah, 27% or 37% somewhere. It was, it's a very small number compared right. to other industries. Well, uh, what's interesting is that back in the 70s, um, it was actually much closer to parity in the U.S. than it is today. Um, more women came into uh, software development, you know, out of, you know, the computational roles that they were serving in, um, in companies. And then it wasn't until the 80s that we really started seeing a drop off of women in, in technology and in particular computer science um, in, in school. And I was just, I think it's fascinating. I don't know if it's true or not, but there's definitely correlative information and data here because you start seeing advertisements in the 80s that are gearing computers to boys right. and making right. it gendered. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pause you there for a second, Mary, because yeah. actually, uh, I've got something I'm gonna pull up on the screen, and then we'll tell tell people that are listening on Spotify or the other uh, podcast channels. But for those who are watching, can see this. So I've got a few adverts that actually support that for you. Um, the first one is from Apple. Uh, <laughs> I apologize, Apple, but it's oh. clearly marketed toward boys getting new PCs, where it's how to buy a personal computer. And it's, you know, mom and dad sitting in the background with all this crazy, you know, old school tech with the sales right. guy, mm -hmm. the little Apple, you know, shirt on there, or the little boy sitting there looking at the computer and touching the keyboard going, oh, wow, look what I can do. And it's very yep. much, you know, boy centric. There's no doubt mm -hmm. about that. Yeah. So that's one. Let me, yeah. let me just, um, I'll pause that for a second. I'm going to go and show you another one now, which I think is even funnier, just to give you an idea of what, you know, Apple's idea was. So. Here's the other one, which I find really amusing. Ah! <laughs> it's a picture of Adam from Ad Adam and Eve with a snake behind him, and he's covering his genitals with a PC. With a computer. With a PC. You know, it's a, a giant it's, it's, computer. With a giant computer, because that means, you know, you wouldn't be able to hide, hide your manhood with an iPhone 5. So. <laughs> and it says, we're looking for the most original use of an Apple since Adam. I mean, it's a huge concept of the Adam and Eve with the Adam and the Apple, but we're Eve. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. I mean, I know that there have been girls in some of the ads, but, oh. I, but my understanding is that a lot of the TV ads, we're looking at how do you, you know, directing people to buy computers for their boys, never directing them to buy computers for girls. Mm -hmm. It's not like there weren't girls in some of the, the, the ads, but those sorts of things are messages that we hear as a culture and that we start believing. And even if right. we're not paying attention to them in some explicit way, the subtlety of it sinks in. And I mean, the numbers reflect that sort of change in the eighties and the nineties. We saw fewer and fewer women going into comp sci roles, um, comp sci programs in schools. Yeah. And now we're talking, we talk about the differences in, in percentages who are applying for jobs. Well, that's a direct relationship in, back to who was actually going to school to learn how to, it, not just how to code, because, it, you know, I find it interesting that it's, um, it's the engineering schools, it's the comp sci schools where we see the biggest drop down in, in women participating. Um, people become programmers in lots of different ways. I, I know that with the, on, the, in, the, the, the later kind of code school, mm -hmm. uh, groups that have come about that more have, more women are going to code schools and that's a different form of developer right. very needed in the world we have to fill jobs and those people are great at filling jobs I even went to a code school because I wanted some refresh on some technology and I knew I wasn't going to do it by myself sitting at home because I I was too busy when I was at home yeah. um, so so I use that sort of thing I get it it's great but how do we get more women really going for comp sci. I, I mean, we've got great brains. We think, well, I mean, cryptography seems like a great thing for women and to be in. better at multitasking than we are. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> who really knows how flustered I get if I have to like send a calendar invite and I'm switching between like my, my calendar and my email. I can't do it. It's just like, it's not in my nature. And Yuri always laughs at me like, so just, just use your automated email thing, Steve, because you're terrible at sending it. <laughs> I'm going to call you out there. 
By you saying I'm better at that because I'm a woman, that's the same argument. Well, I, I am I mean, no better at this. multitasking than a man, and a man is no better at multitasking than me. Now, I may be better than you. Yeah, <laughs> that might be the case. I thought there was research done about the fact that women are better generally at, at hear, like for example, <laughs> that generally women can hear multiple things happening at the same time, and men can only listen to one thing at a time. Yeah, but why? But why? Why people in general? What's that? Is that because of our gender or is that because we have more practice? I don't know. I don't know because I think it's like, when I talked to my wife about it, she's able to like, you know, take in information from two kids and me and she heard everything all at once. And I'm just like, I can't hear everything at once. I have to hear one thing at a time. And I, when I studied psychology, I remember that these were topics that came up about there were gender differences in the way our bodies are designed because women are mothers and they have to be able to multitask on information flow Whereas for whatever reasons, maybe the way our bodies are developed. Yeah. I don't know if that's necessarily true. I'm just saying it's what I learned in my psychology. Right. No, no, no. I was in those psychology classes too. I, yeah. I was a psych major actually in college. So, so was I. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, but I, mean, I, don't, I just that's question that. whether or not it's social, like part, part of the problem with it's all of these. Socialized rather than true. Right. Mm -hmm. Which one, which, which issues are caused by socialization? And which issues are caused by, by it's the nature nurture. I totally fashion, agree right? with that. It's very possible. And so yeah. we don't really know. We don't know if we get better at these things when we're five years old, when we're one year old, when we're 25 years old. We don't know when those things are really happening. We can mm -hmm. test it, yeah. but we can't tell why. Right. Um, it, it's really not uh, predictable in that sort of way. The, you know, to, in, in, and to the focus sort of thing, I don't know. Well, there's, just, there's something else to be said as well, which is if it's kind of like that self-fulfilling prophecy. If women keep saying you're not good at multitasking to men, then of course it's the same thing. And we all believe we're not good at multitasking, right? But that's not or, saying it's true. It's just socialized. And that's what you're saying. I agree with that. Maybe we're right. socializing th certain things into our society that are leading us to believe yeah. in something which isn't true. Well, certainly, certainly priming is exactly that. I mean, yeah. there's lots of studies that show in the U.S. in particular, where there already is a cultural assessment about women not being as, as good at math or not being as good as good at science, that if yeah. you remind them before they take a test that there is this cultural belief, mm -hmm. they will do more poorly in taking that next test. Wow. And yeah. if you okay. don't remind them, they do much better. It's amazing how so, bias affects our behaviors in ways exactly. that we can't even control. Um, yeah. sometimes we just naturally respond to it, although we know it's not true. And it's, inc it's incredible how our brains do this to ourselves. Yes. <laughs> we're such self-destructive creatures. <laughs> but we're also very creative and innovative, so. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> That's why we're talking about crypto, right? Yeah. Yep. Innovations. <laughs> So Mary, where do you see the crypto space headed? You're, you know, you're deep in it right now and, and running a, a very exciting company. Where do you see wow. things headed in five, 10 years from now? What gets you excited? Well, you know, <laughs> I'm biased. Uh, I'm running a particular kind of company that is a little different than a, t than a lot of crypto companies um, because the sort of currency that we're really promoting and designing and working on is one that we think um, will be transformative. Um, so currently, most crypto is token-based. Mm -hmm. And we are talking about doing a mutual uh, asset-backed currency, which just functions completely differently in the world. And we think that that function actually has the potential for changing patterns in a way that current crypto doesn't. Like the current crypto world, to a certain degree, is replicating the patterns of money, fiat money. Mm -hmm. uh, they're just doing it in ways that are anonymous. Right. Um, right. And they're doing it in ways that are, uh, you know, algorithmic. But if you look at some of the, the centralization patterns even around crypto, sure, it started out with different people having it and different people uh, exchanging it and, and building uh, value through mining. Yeah. Absolutely. It wasn't the traditional, uh, it wasn't the traditional holders of fiat money. But little by little, there's been a centralization of who can afford to mine, how big of a mining um, uh, you know, pro process can some project can somebody put together. And then there's 
basically those those same patterns of money begets money begets money. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a centralizing pattern. And what we're looking to do with, with a different kind of cryptocurrency, an asset-backed currency that is fundamentally running on a distributed platform and, and, and running with distributed asset kind of at, at its base is that that doesn't have to be replicated, that, that we actually can have value be distributed and the exchange of value stay distributed. So right. that, that's what we're looking for. And that's one of the things I'm hoping to see really shift in the patterns of crypto in, in the next five to 10 years. What kind of assets are you referring to when you describe assets? It's not just fiat, you're talking other assets as well? No, 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 no. So, so with Holo, so I know that um, uh, we've talked a little bit about, you guys had David Atkinson on, on the yeah. Yeah. podcast before, and he talked a little bit about Holochain, and I'm not sure how much he talked about Holo. And Holo really is the first large scale application of Holochain. And what it is, is a distributed hosting um, cloud network essentially. So a little bit like Airbnb is with people who have houses and people who are looking for someplace to stay. Mm -hmm. Polo allows people to host applications and sort of be a node in the cloud essentially. And then you have app providers who are basically coming out and putting their application that they want made available to people on the internet at, on the, all of these various holo hosts, okay? Right. So, so it's, a, it's a marketplace, essentially. Um, but it has a currency built into it. And that currency, holo fuel, is actually backed by the capacity of the network. Mm -hmm. So in oh, this wow. particular instance, its hosting capacity is the asset. In other instances, because we've got other people who are building on Holochain right now, food is the asset. Or energy is the asset. Okay, and what oh, cool. Vision is all of these different asset-backed currencies coming in, and then having interoperability between those asset-backed currencies. Wow, that's so cool. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really. I, I'm just going to talk about something completely different. So I pulled up your yeah. website, and I see that you used to be involved with some. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> women, women football club. So just tell me a little bit about that. Cause you seem to have a lot of interest when I'm looking at your interest in um, sports, you're interested in software development, uh, interest yeah. in being involved with women in football. So just tell me a little bit. about that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, so close I, it out anyway, cause we move off of technology and a little bit back to you, which is kind of more. Yeah. <laughs> Put you yeah. on the spot now. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I grew up in Spain. So when we say football, let's be clear, we're talking soccer in the U.S. Right. Um, yeah, sorry, right. I'm in London, so I meant football. I meant <laughs> soccer, American <laughs> soccer, <laughs> worldwide football, but American soccer. That's right. Right, exactly. So, uh, yeah, I decided, I don't know, about four or five years ago, I decided, oh, I'm wanting to kind of shift into a new way of being in my body. And I started doing all sorts of different activities that I might have done when I was younger. And one of them was soccer. And I said, great, I want to play soccer. Let's go around and find a league. Hmm, there's a women's league. I'll start a team. <laughs> <Because> everybody <laughs> who wants to play yeah. soccer yeah. say, I'll start a team. Yeah. <laughs> so I did. And it was called Optimus United. And it was fantastic. Amazing group of women. Uh, you know, I, when I first started, I, I didn't, um, I just started telling everybody, I, I've used Craigslist, you know, I started telling all these women, it was right after the women's team in the U.S. had won uh, the World Cup, and uh, so there was a lot of excitement around women's soccer in that moment, and so started, I put together a team, and you know, I said, well, we'll be optimists, we not, might not be good, but we'll be optimistic. <laughs> That's and that's great. kind of how it went. You know, that's it was fun. a league for fun. What yeah, um, did you guys do? Uh, you know, depends on the year. Some years we did terribly. <laughs> the, the first you, year I had a lot of pulled muscles. Uh, <laughs> you had I a had lot of fun. You won some games, you lost some games, and you had yeah. a great experience. And yeah, we, we've fun. never been at the top of the ranks, I'll say that. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> You're an optimist, so that doesn't matter. Yeah. Exactly. We did enjoy our beer after the game. <laughs> That's the oh, best yeah. part. It's right there. That's the best. Yeah, absolutely. Yuri, any, any last questions from you before we wrap up? No. So just with Mary, you are such a go-getter and, and 
I think it's fascinating and amazing that you were, again, with, with the soccer team, you're like, you've just created your own companies and creative paths. You saw that there was an opening, a need for a soccer team. And you're like, I'm just going to create this because why not? Is there some advice you could give to anybody who's listening to this about how to, you know, get more fire in them to be a go-getter and to follow your example like that? Well, one of the things, so this isn't quite an answer to your question, but, sure. <laughs> but, but it's, but it's my, it's, it's a, it's a piece of advice I'd like to give to women, whether they're pitching a company, whether they're um, pitching an idea uh, or, or just responding to a group or giving a demo. Mm -hmm. There is a difference in the way that people receive information when a woman is presenting. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, th this goes back to, to, again, research about groups, yeah. doesn't have, all that sorts of things. And, and one of the things that happen is that women tend to be questioned about the details. They go into the weeds. Men will ask you, are you sure that you can, um, are, are you sure about how that operational model works and have you done all this analysis? And so you, you've just given a pitch, to, you know, a six minute pitch basically mm -hmm. for your business. And they're going to drill down into the weeds to question something. And most women, guess what? They just answer the question and they drill, they go right with the guy down into the weeds. Yeah. If you're a man, you're asked about the opportunities and you answer about the opportunities. So answer the questions but end on an opportunity always. Tell people how great it's gonna be, always. It doesn't matter if you're pitching an idea at a company, if you're pitching right. a, a company at a startup event to, to investors, it doesn't matter where you are. Leave people with possibility. I yeah. love it. That's great, thank you. That was super, what a, what a great way to wrap up this episode. <laughs> That's just amazing. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, I've loved the conversation. Have another of course, opportunity thank you, Mary. To come back and talk to us again because this was such a great experience for I think all of us and I've really enjoyed talking to you and Yuri I'm sure you'd mirror that this has been this has been a fantastic interview so so Mary Camacho executive director at Holochain thank you so much for joining us today on the coin chat thank you everybody for listening in watching subscribing if you're not already a subscriber give us a subscribe hit that little bell on your way out and uh, do that because you love Mary because she's been amazing today it's been a great episode to the moon until next time <laughs>